Joshua chapter 7, continuing in our study of Joshua 7. We'll read the whole chapter, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until eventide. He and the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall environ us round, and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against the morrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the households which the Lord shall take shall come by man, and it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken, and he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarhites, and he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought the household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had 
and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burnt them with fire, after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones this day, so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and for this word from the book of Joshua. I pray, God, that you would help us to understand these scriptures and apply them to our lives as only you can do through your spirit. We love you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, a few weeks back, I did preach on the, uh, the Valley of Achor, which is a door of hope for Christians, meaning when judgment falls, Christians reap the benefit of it. I mean, if you're on the right side, if you're on God's side, you're on the Lord's side, you're obeying Him, you're walking with Him, when judgment falls, even in your own camp, even in your own congregation, even in the, your own nation, um, whether it's upon believers or unbelievers alike, those that are spared are those that are walking with God. And therefore, that valley of Achor, that valley of judgment, can be a door of hope for those that are with the Lord. Here, Joshua chapter 7 talks about Achan and the story. And we'll deal with it today in the context of Joshua at large. Uh, chapter 6 there, in verse 18, the Bible says, And ye, and any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed, when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. And so someone that is righteous, if they take of an accursed thing, their cleanness, their righteousness, doesn't fall on the accursed thing and clean it up and make it all good. No, dirty sullies and destroys and wrecks what is clean every time that it's touched. Unless something supernatural comes and God is able to cleanse something that is unclean. But here, God makes it clear. If you touch the accursed thing, you'll be accursed yourself. Not only that, though, but it says you will make all of the camp of Israel accursed and will trouble it. In chapter 7 and verse 1, it says, But, this is interesting, the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Now look at this. For Achan, and it continues on. So, Achan was the singular person specifies him as the son of Carmi, of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. This Achan was the only one that took of the accursed thing. Nevertheless, chapter 7 begins and says that the children of Israel committed the trespass. In other words, the anger of God fell upon the congregation as a whole for the sins of one people. And I'm reminded of that, that famous verse was actually brought up very early in the ministry of sound words as a church, and that is one sinner destroyeth much good. You can have much good in a congregation. You can have much good in a family, let's say. You can have much good in a nation even. It only takes one sinner to destroy that good. Only a little bit of leaven can leaven the whole lump. A little bit of sin festers and permeates and spreads and sullies all that are around them. And so here we have the children of Israel marked as committing a trespass, even though it was all Achan. We need to understand that, that our actions affect the body. We have here a body of Christ. We also make up the larger body of Christ, which is believers at large. But every one of us has a body that we are part of, and especially the men here are in charge of overseeing their household. Men, be on guard. Your sin, one sin that you commit, can affect your whole body. And also be mindful of those that are within your household, because one sin of those that you are overseeing can affect the whole body. Think about smashing your little baby toe. It's a very small member against the side of a chair or against the side of a cabinet. Man, does that hurt the whole body. Smacking that thing will make the whole body fall to the ground and crumble, and you're going to have tears coming down your eyes for the pain of a broken little tiny digit. That's how it works. you got to think of that illustration when you think of the little sins and temptations that are placed before you in choosing whether or not you are going to partake of those things. Are you willing to take advantage of a little opportunity to sin that could affect the whole body of your family, the whole body of your church, the whole body of believers at large, trouble the whole nation so that you can, uh, you can fall to one little temptation. Understand that nobody's an island to themselves and everybody has 
um, within them a realm or a sphere of people surrounding them that are affected by the decisions that they make. Your decisions affect everybody around you. Now, he gives then a little bit of an aside here. It says that in the end of verse 1, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel at large. Now an aside starts, and it says here in verse 2, And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven. So we saw the aside. This is known by the narrator only in verse 1, because he basically gives the reason and the cause for what is about to transpire. And so we know, going into the chapter now, exactly why Israel is about to suffer the fate that they suffer in the ensuing verses. It says... Ai, which is beside beth Avan, on the east side of Bethel, spake unto them, saying, So Joshua proclaims to the people, it says, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. Verse 3, And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. And so he's saying these are few. In other words, these are a lesser enemy than we've ever experienced before, at least this side of the river. They're far less than Jericho. They're few. And so keep most of us back. Don't make us labor. Set about two or 3,000 men, and they will go up and, and make, make easy work of smiting Ai. Now, to date, we've seen lots of obedience from Joshua. And we've seen time and time again where the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, and Joshua did. The Lord said, do, and Joshua did. The Lord said, do, and Joshua did. Joshua is, is, a, is a man after God's own heart, though he was never given that title. He's a man that is obedient. God says it, he does it right away. It, it, almost in the same chapter, or sorry, in the same verse sometimes, he's simply obeying exactly what God says. Now here in verse 2, we have an interesting thing that takes place where Joshua sends men... To view the country, in verse 3 it says, They returned and said unto him, and they say, Let not all the people go up. Now who's speaking here? These, these spies, these men that went to look at the land, check it out. They come back and say, You know what? Don't send everybody. Here you don't find a thus saith the Lord. You don't find a God said do this. You see a little bit of, of Joshua falling away from his previous pattern. Where? The Lord says, and Joshua does. Now you have a group of men saying, these spies, what they say, don't send everybody. Let some of us not labor thither. There are a few. We can take them out with a few. And the counsel now, and the command now, and the suggestion now, the, the, the voice comes from these men, and Joshua follows them in that. Now, if we remember... God's pattern to date hasn't been to withhold troops, has it? He has never said anything even remotely like this. Just, just go a few of you, right? Though he does always say that, hey, those armies are greater than thou. Those armies are mightier than thou. And I will be with you certainly to fight these battles for you. He does say that. And that might give you the, the idea that, hey, you know, we could, we could go with less and still do great things in, in God's in God's uh, will. But that's the problem. It, are they in God's will? Now remember Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. The Bible says in Joshua 1 verse 14 that all of their mighty men came to help Israel. So God's not in the business of, of withholding the troops and keeping them back. He's just in the business of sending all of the troops that are indeed less than the armies that they are facing, but then stepping in and, and helping them to close that gap. He wants everybody then to get involved in the labor. He wants everybody then here to get involved in the battle that's before them. And I think this is kind of part of the problem that is taking place. Of course, we know that Israel is made accursed. But maybe some of these bad decisions are as a result of them being accursed and taking in the accursed thing. And Joshua was susceptible to it as well. And he agrees with them in this one thing. And so he sends out just a few. In verse 4 it says, so there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. Verse 5, And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Shabarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted, 
and became as water. So here Israel is smitten before their enemies. 36 men fall and die that day. But I think the most significant loss that took place is their loss of strength and of courage, which is what they've been charged to have throughout this book. Be strong and of a good courage. And now we find them with melted hearts that have become as water, just pooled up on the floor. No strength, no courage left in them at all for the battle that they had just lost. Now verse 6, Joshua, as he often does, has the correct response. Now in our lives, whenever you start to see a failure where before you had a rather easy victory, think about Jericho. I mean, they just walked around this thing. And then on the seventh day, God gave them strength to walk around it seven times. The walls fell down flat, and they made, they made a, an easy destruction of their enemy once they entered in through those walls. In our lives, when we see victory, and it's easy, and we're doing great things, and it hasn't been a problem, and suddenly there are failures. When we've always had strength and we're strong to overcome and to do great things, and, and we're, 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 we're walking with God, and suddenly there is weakness, when we're finding that we, we used to be strong and, and, and bold and, and full of courage, but now we're feeling a little bit discouraged, here's the response that we ought to do. It may be that we have touched and taken of the accursed thing. It may be that we are not immediately being obedient with God in a few areas, but whatever the case, if you start to see that where there was victory, now you're failing. Where you were strong, now you are weak. Where you were full of courage, now you are discouraged. Do as Joshua does. In verse 6, Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He, the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan, and to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content to dwell on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth, and what wilt thou do unto thy great name? So he correctly understood here that only in God is their victory. He says, Lord, if we're turning our backs, it's only because you are not before us. The Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land are certainly going to destroy us. Why? Because they have discovered that, God, you are not with us. So he correctly understands here that only in God is their victory because these enemies would soon eat them up if they only got a little bit of courage in them and realized that God was not for them at this time. He also correctly then seeks that God would get the glory in all of the things that are done. He said, what wilt thou do unto thy great name? Lord, never mind us falling, but if we fall in this land, all the heathen will rejoice over thy great name and that sometimes that's a good thing to re remind God of remind yourself of your representative of the Lord Jesus Christ if you fall if you fail if you're weak if you're discouraged that is a that is an indication that either God is not with you or God is not able to overcome what is in your life so we need to think of these things before we start to carry ourselves all sad and despondently around while proclaiming to be a Christian We've got joy, 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 joy down in our hearts, and people need to see that. They also need to see that we have the victory. We are overcomers through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Joshua here falls on his face, mourns in sackcloth and ashes, calls upon the Lord and says, Lord, if they destroy us, how will that look upon you? He's realizing that if they're destroyed as a result of what they have done here today, that God is going to be the one that ultimately takes the black eye and the heat for it. He will be the one that, that is mocked out of that land. Now, verse 10, we have to remind ourselves that, that Joshua, while he was correct in his response to fall before the Lord in sackcloth and ashes and repent and pray unto him, he was correct in his response, but he also was grossly misunderstanding the cause for all these things. And the cause comes up here in verse 10. The Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up! <laughs> Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? What are you doing? 
It was a good response, to be fair. I mean, if, if, I'm, if I'm failing, if I'm faltering, if I'm weak where I was strong and in victory, maybe I'm doing something wrong. So Joshua rightly falls on his face and starts praying on the behalf of the people that were there. And he'd seen Moses do that, and he'd done it himself before, time and time again for this people. But God says, get up. In other words, this is not about you. This is not your sin to take upon you. Joshua, get up. And he says in verse 11, here's the cause for all these things. Israel hath sinned. Of course, Joshua is a part of Israel. Of course, he's the leader of Israel. And therefore, these things do fall on his shoulders. The buck stops here as far as it comes to the, the earthly ministry of the people of Israel. But he says, look, Joshua, get up. Israel hath sinned. In verse 11, it continues and says, And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and assembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. So the cause then of the failure at Ai was as a result of sin. They kept not themselves back from the accursed thing. Therefore, they have stolen the accursed thing. And the Bible says here, though, that they also dissembled. They dissembled also, meaning they lied, they deceived, they tried to hide their sins. Now, if, if Achan was confident that that was his to take, why did he then go and hide it in among his stuff, hiding it even buried in his own tent? It was because he was dissembler at this time. He needed to lie about it. He needed to deceive. He needed to hide these things. When I was a young kid or when I was a teenager and, and I knew I had something bad in my possessions, you know what I did? I took it back to the tent of my bedroom and I stuffed it under my bed behind, behind the, uh, the drawers, those drawers that could remove out. You could put stuff in behind it, right? Like, like that, was, that was my logical thinking. Why? Because I, I kept not myself back from that thing and I stole that thing, let's say, and, 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 uh, and needed to lie to my parents and lie to the leaders and, and hide those things. And you're like, brother, Josh, you, you wicked heathen, you. And yeah, I did those things. I did those things. But, you know, parents are smart. And when your bed sheet's tucked in underneath, and uh, where it would have been tucked normally underneath, you know, it doesn't take long for them to say, that looks out of place. Pulled it out, and there's all my sin exposed before, before so the world can see it. Tried to hide it in darkness. <clears throat> but that's the point is what has happened here, and God calls them out for it. Not only did they do what he didn't want to do, but as always is the case, when you keep not yourself back from God's clear um, commands when you transgress and you go beyond and you steal and you lie and you cheat next thing you know you're lying to cover it up and hiding things and cover it just keeps getting worse and worse sin is a downward spiral and that's why we need to understand that just a little sin will not only spread and permeate amongst the congregation it spreads and permeates in you and look we see that it started with Achan it wasn't enough for him to just take of the accursed thing then he had to lie about it then he had to steal away and hide it under his tent. Then he had to live this double life where he knows it's there, but he doesn't want anyone to know. And for a while there, maybe he even saw the judgment that fell upon his people at Israel. And he was like, I wonder if this has something to do with me. I better keep this hush. I better keep this quiet. And it just kept getting worse and worse for him as he tried to cloak and cover that sin. Now, we see then the cause was sin. Now, what was the effect of the sin? Verse 12, it says... Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies. Because they were a curse, neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. So, if we, as God's people, disobey God, if we, as God's people, follow men to our own hurt, because again, I see that these things kind of pair up. Israel had sinned, okay? Okay specifically Achan, and Achan's sin compop, or compiled and it got bigger because he took the thing, the next thing you know he's lying about it. What happened to Israel was they were unaware of the accursed thing. His sin was put upon them and they were now guilty of it. And next thing you know, they're obeying men to their own hurt. They're saying, yeah, let's hold back some of the troops. We got this. We, God's got this. I think the confidence there wasn't in God. They didn't say, you know what? 
Joshua, let's send like five people because God's going to get a great victory today. No, they said, let's send about two or 3,000 people. Why? Because it's going to be a piece of cake for us to take care of these people. There's no glory to God there. And so they were in disobedience. They were following men to their own hurt. They were not trusting in the Lord. And they were adding sin unto sin unto sin. And this was the immediate effect of what had taken place. And then finally, he says, neither will I be with you anymore. And so certainly the effect of the sins and adding sin to sin to sin is that God eventually removes his care and provision from you. And then he says, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. In other words, except ye make it right. So we have the, the problem or the cause. We have the effect. And what was the solution then? Well, it's right there in that same verse. The accursed must be destroyed. And so he's going to give then the people some steps to follow. Verse 13, it says, Up, sanctify the people, or sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. So he says very clearly, there is something accursed, you need to take care of it. Sanctify yourself, separate yourself, clean yourselves up, and prepare against tomorrow. What is going to transpire in verse 14? In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which, watch this, the Lord taketh, shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So there's a very severe punishment here for the folly that this man brings, and this man works. The, the punishment will be doled out to one in particular that God in particular has set aside. Now, I'm not sure exactly how God does it. There's been times in the Bible where he says, cast lots, you know, there's, you know, 12 tribes, we're going to cast 12 sided die and, and see which one would take. And, and there's nothing wrong with that if led by God in order to, to choose what, um, where God is leading in this case. It doesn't really show you exactly how God takes them, but certainly what comes to pass is that God calls them out in a multitude and then takes a group and then takes a group and then takes a man until certainly in the end, there's no doubt in Joshua's mind who it is. Verse 16, it says, So Joshua rose up early in the morning, as he's often to do. And, and again, this is another great trait of Joshua that we should all adapt and uh, get up early in the morning. And he says, And brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah... And he took the family of the Zarhites, and he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man, and Zabdi was taken, and he brought his household man by man. The household of Zabdi is brought, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Now Joshua doesn't indicate any kind of doubt in the Lord's ability to take a man out of a house, to take a man out of a tribe, to take a man out of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, because he proclaims very clearly right here in verse 19, Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done, hide it not from me. So very clearly he comes and he addresses the sinner and says, confess what you have done. Tell me what you have done. Verse 20, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. And so the Lord led the leader to, to bring the sinner to the point of confession. And the, the sinner here confesses, verse 21, When I saw the spoils, among the spoils, a goodly Babylonish garment... 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent. 
and the silver under it. And so he confesses his own covetousness and that he saw the shekels and he saw the gold and silver and he saw this goodly Babylonish garment, um, you know, this beautiful looking um, piece of clothing. And he coveted it so much that he took of it and brought it back and, and buried it in the midst of his tent. And that's where it is hidden at this time. And so he confesses very plainly. Now, he confessed, and, and they're about to find out whether his confession was true. Verse 22, So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. So he confessed. He showed them his sin. They found it just as he had said. Is this repentance? Is this making it right? I think so. So should this then be no harm, no foul? Should we just forgive Achan and let it go? Well, we can't though, because not only did God command a specific order for them, don't take of this thing. But then he further replied that since he did, here is the punishment that is required. And the punishment was plain back in verse 13. He said, Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away from the accursed thing among you. Verse 12, Neither will I be with you anymore except ye destroy the accursed from among you. So not only is there an accursed thing that needs to be removed, but there is also one that is accursed that needs to be removed. And of course, he prescribed very quickly the order that had to take place. And they're about to do what God said. Verse 24, and Joshua, said, and Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And so this place had become so famous as a result of Achan and his sins and what's about to transpire here that they actually named it after him. Verse 25, and Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burnt them with fire And th after they had stoned them with stones. Exactly what God had prescribed they do. We're going to have to see then that God's justice always has to be served. Sin always needs to be punished as God requires. And so, exactly as he said is exactly what they did. Verse 26, They raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. And so, you see then the effects of the sin that one man had committed. One man commits this sin of covetousness. And covetousness is when, you, is when you desire something that's not yours. And that will eventually lead somebody to steal, to, to, to take, to, to, uh, to have what doesn't belong to them. And that's what he did. He coveted what belonged unto someone else. Here specifically, the Lord was to receive of the gold and silver. And then from there, he had to lie about it. His sin then affected and infected the people of Israel. So next thing you know, they're just as accursed as he is. And what did that cause them to do? Well, their sin became that they stopped listening to the Lord and his leading as far as taking over this promised land. And they started to trust in their own might, their own judgment, and their own reasoning. And the judgments of, of the men, these wise men that went out and saw the land and said we certainly have enough and they did the math and said you know what two or three thousand should be sufficient and Joshua was so so infected by the thought too that he just went along with it and Joshua who had a long since proven that he was more than capable of hearing God and doing what God said and hearing God and doing what God said now he heard the men and did not what God said and fell prey of and it fell victim to the same trap that all of the people of Israel were caught up in. Now, when it gets to the end, in order to set things right, we find the same thing that Joshua was known for. It seems even he repented and realized that he needs to just 
hear the Lord and do what God says. And so Joshua in verse 16 rises up early in the morning and he's right back to his old self. He's ready to hear what God says. In the previous verses, verse 14 and verse 15, he gets up and then from 16 on he carries out exactly what God had said. And Joshua did, and Joshua did, and Joshua did. So our lessons here, be mindful of the sins and the effect that they have. They, they permeate the whole of society, it seems. We need to be more like Joshua and exhibit his character in our own lives where simply do what God says. Don't fall into the traps that the world may fall into when they get themselves committing trespasses and the accursed thing and doing against the will of God. And even here we have Achan who would be considered a child of God doing the accursed thing. Don't get involved in those things. You know, the New Testament principle is touch not the unclean thing and, and I will receive you and you shall be a child and I shall be your son. That's the New Testament principle that I believe points back to this same thing. We're to be clean. We're to be distinct. We're to be separate from the world and from their ways and from these accursed things. Beautiful garments, the, the money and the shekels of weight that, that we see and we covet. We don't want anything to do with that. Our... Our gold and our silver and our beautiful garment needs to be that of obedience to the Lord Almighty. And that's all we need to covet, let's say. That's all we need to desire is to follow God and His will and do as Joshua did. The Lord says, you do. The Lord says, you do. The Lord says, you do, lest you become an accursed thing. So much so that your destruction has a nameplate now, has a, has a, has a, a testimony where people will say, oh man, Remember how that brother fell? And, and they, they remember. remember. Remember what happened in that place? Yeah, that's the place where that brother was, was destroyed as the fierceness of God's anger fell upon him. You don't want to be a byword. You don't want to be a proverb of bad things happening to you because of God's anger falling upon you. You want to be like Joshua. And to date, I've yet to find the Bible even mention something extremely negative about Joshua because he's always been obedient and obedient and obedient. Except this one thing, it seems that a sin from the bottom had creeped all the way up to the leadership, had affected his mind, and he made a wrong decision following the multitude to commit a sin and to transgress right along with them. Thank you, Father, for the